Abdul Baha, the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, was born in Tehran on May the 23rd, 1844, at midnight, the same evening that the Bab revealed his mission in Shiraz. He was named Abbas after his grandfather, but later in life took the name Abdul Baha, the servant of the glory. Abdul Baha was barely three months old when Mullah Hussein brought to Tehran a scroll of the Bab's writings and presented it to Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah's acceptance of the Bab's message was immediate and unconditional. At once, he began to promote the new teachings in his home province of Nur in Tehran. Thus, from the earliest months of infancy, Abdul Baha was raised in the light and shelter of a fresh revelation of God's grace to humankind. His early childhood was a very happy one. The home of Baha'u'llah became a center for the early believers in the Bab's faith. Tahare was a frequent visitor to Baha'u'llah's home, and she often used during her short visits to take the child on her knee and speak with him. He admired her most deeply. One visit of Tahare's, Abdul Baha remembered with special clarity. He was sitting on her knee in his mother's private parlor. As the door of the room was open, they could hear, from behind the curtain, the voice of Vahid, who was talking and arguing with his father with fervor and eloquence about the signs and verses that bore witness to the advent of the new manifestation. Suddenly, Tahare interrupted Vahid and raising her voice, vehemently declared, O oh, Yahya, let deeds, not words, testify to thy faith if thou art a man of true learning. Cease idly repeating the traditions of the past, for the day of service of steadfast action is come. Now is the time to show forth the true signs of God, to rend asunder the veils of idle fancy, to promote the word of God and to sacrifice ourselves in his path. Let deeds, not words, be our adorning. Nabil also painted a pen portrait of Abdul Baha in these early years when he was asked to accompany the child to school. I gladly consented, and as I was preparing to leave, I saw the most great branch a child of exquisite beauty emerged from the room of his father. He descended the steps and I advanced and stretched forth my arms to carry him. He told me, we shall walk together, and he took my hand and led me out of the house. We chatted together as we walked hand in hand in the direction of the madras there known in those days by the name of Parminar. As we reached his classroom, he turned to me and said, Come again this afternoon and take me back to my home, for Isfandiar is unable to fetch me. My father will need him today. I returned to the madrasa in time to conduct the most great branch to his home. When the searing summer heat and the fear of cholera emptied the great houses of Tehran, Baha'u'llah often took his family to a villa on the cool and wooded slopes above the city or to their ancestral home in the village of Takur. The house was surrounded with a beautiful garden filled with flowers, fruit trees and flowering shrubs. It was here the young Abdul Baha and his sister spent many happy hours. It was most probably here that Abdul Baha learned to ride, a sport in which he delighted and in which he excelled. In Takur, Baha'u'llah took his young son with him on horseback across the hills and through the villages that formed part of the extensive family estate. A story is recorded that one day Abdu'l-Baha went to see the thousands of sheep which Baha'u'llah then owned. 
the shepherds, wishing to honour their young guest, gave a feast for him. At the close of the day, when he was preparing to go home, the shepherd advised him that it was customary to leave a present for the shepherds. Abdul Baha told them that he had nothing to give. Yet the shepherd persisted that he must give something. Many years later, Abdul Baha himself recounted the rest of the story in his own words. I was indeed in a dilemma, but thinking a moment, the idea came to me to give each shepherd a few sheep from our own flocks. I communicated the idea to the overseer, who was rather pleased with it, and it was announced in a solemn tone and immediately acted upon. When at last we reached home and my act of generosity was related to the blessed perfection Baha'u'llah, he laughed very much over it and said, we must appoint a guardian to protect our Aqa from his own liberality, else some day he may give himself away. Abdul Baha, at a very early age, contracted tuberculosis. Many years later, when speaking of the illness which kept him in Paris for a period longer than expected, he brought to mind those years of his childhood. Were it not for this illness, I would not have stayed in Paris more than a month. There is a reason for this. It has been so from the early years of my life. The wisdom of whatever has happened to me has become apparent later. While I was a child in Tehran, seven years of age, I contracted tuberculosis. There was no hope of recovery. Afterwards, the wisdom of and the reason for this became evident. Were it not for that illness, I would have been in Marzandaran. But because of it, I remained in Tehran and was there when the Blessed Perfection was imprisoned. Thus, I travelled to Iraq in his company. And when the time came, although physicians had despaired of my recovery, I was suddenly cured. It happened in spite of the fact that all had said a cure was impossible. Abdul Baha was only eight years old when, in the wake of a desperate and futile attempt on the life of Nasruddin Shah by two half-crazed men, Baha'u'llah was imprisoned and the Babis were ferociously persecuted. Baha'u'llah's house was pillaged, his lands and goods were confiscated, and his family reduced from opulence to penury. One day, while in Europe, Abdul Baha recalled the sufferings of those bleak times. In Tehran, we possessed everything at a nightfall, and on the morrow we were shorn of it all, to the extent that we had no food to eat. I was hungry, but there was no bread to be had. My mother poured some flour into the palm of my hand, and I ate that instead of bread. At that time of dire calamities and attacks mounted by the enemies, I was a child of eight. They threw so many stones into our house that the courtyard was crammed with them. Mother took us for safety to another quarter and later asked me to go to my aunt's house and ask her to find us a few coins. I went and my aunt did what she could. She tied a coin in a handkerchief and gave it to me. On my way home, someone recognised me and shouted, Here is a Barbie! Whereupon the children in the street chased me. I found refuge in the entrance to a house and stayed there until nightfall. When I came out, I was once again pursued by the children who kept yelling at me and pelted me with stones. When I reached home, I was exhausted. Mother wanted to know what had happened to me. I could not utter a word and collapsed. Baha'u'llah was imprisoned in the Sia Chal for four months. As Sia Khanu, the mother of Abdul Baha, was able, with the help of a relative, to obtain two small rooms for rent near the prison for herself and her children. Around them on the street, the Barbies were being searched from house to house, imprisoned, tortured or killed. 
Bahir Khanum left us a vivid memory of those terrible days. We three children were locked in the house hugging our mother. No one knew if the next victim would be our mother or even ourselves. No one could feel safe. Our mother went out every day to bring food to our father and the three of us remained hidden in the house, anxiously awaiting his return. I was only six years old and I held in my arms, which were not so strong, little Mirza Mehdi. Abdul Baha suffered greatly from being away from his father. He later recounted, They sent me with a black servant to his blessed presence in the prison. The warders indicated the cell and the servant carried me in on his shoulders. I saw a dark, steep place. We entered a small, narrow doorway and went down two steps, but beyond those one could see nothing. In the middle of the stairway, all of a sudden we heard his blessed voice, do not bring him in here, and so they took me back. We sat outside, waiting for the prisoners to be led out. Suddenly they brought the blessed perfection out of the dungeon. He was chained to several others. What a chain! It was very heavy. The prisoners could only move it alone with great difficulty. Sad and heartrending it was. Bahá'u'lláh was so battered that he could not even walk. His neck was swollen under the cruel steel collar, his body bent forward under the weight of the great chain. The sight of his beloved father in those miserable conditions struck the tender heart of the very young Abdul Baha, who, overwhelmed by shock and pain, fainted to the ground and was carried away lifeless. When Baha'u'llah was eventually released from prison, he came home to his family. He was unrecognizable. However, no sooner was the reunion achieved than the family suffered another cruel separation. They were being exiled from Iran to Baghdad. The small party of exiles left Tehran on a bitterly cold winter morning. Three months of exhausting travel now lay ahead, over bleak terrain and through mountain passes in a cold so intense that no one could speak and ice and snow so abundant that it was impossible to move. They were all insufficiently clothed and suffered keenly from exposure. Abdul Baha, in particular, was very thinly clad. Riding upon a horse, his feet, ankles and wrists were very much exposed to the cold, which was so severe that they became frostbitten and swollen and caused him great pain. Abdul Baha felt the effects of that frostbite for the rest of his life. They arrived in Baghdad in April 1853, in a state of great misery. The sufferings of the family were indescribable. Abdul Baha had left Tehran still suffering from tuberculosis. However, in spite of this serious illness, and despite the ordeals of the winter journey, once in Baghdad, suddenly, and against the opinions of the doctors who had pronounced his condition incurable, he made a full recovery. Sometime during the first year in Baghdad, Abdul Baha perceived, through his own spiritual insight, the meaning of the mystery that had occurred in the Sia Chal. He was only nine years old, but, though still a child, 
he alone understood the cause of the new radiance which seemed to enfold his father like a shining vesture. He recognized the station of Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God, and though still so young in years, threw himself at Baha'u'llah's feet and begged to be allowed to offer up his own life in his pathway. Of that declaration of Baha'u'llah made only to his son, we have the account of Abdul Baha himself, 60 years later. I am the servant of the Blessed Perfection. In Baghdad I was a child. Right in that city and at that moment, he announced the word to me and I believed in him. As soon as he proclaimed the word to me, I threw myself at his feet and begged him and pleaded with him to accept my blood as a sacrifice on his path. The sacrifice, at least of his life, was accepted and lasted for 57 years of prison and exile, in the restriction of which he was faithful to his servitude to God and to man, as incessant as the heartbeat. The Bab affirms that the first to believe in a manifestation of God is the essence of the fulfillment of the preceding dispensation, and thus Abdul Baha, the first to believe with all his being in the mission of his father, was the most eminent representative of the virtues announced by the Bab. Already in his young life, Abdul Baha had experienced bitter persecution, homelessness, and utter impoverishment. But when his beloved father went away to Sulaymaniyah, Abdul Baha was desolate. He fell into great despondency. He would go away by himself, and when sought for, he would be found weeping, often falling into such a deep grief that no one could console him. His chief occupation was copying and committing to memory the tablets of the Bab. His childhood and youth was in all respects unusual. Horseback riding was the only diversion of which he was fond. Bahia Khanu, the sister of Abdul Baha, has recounted. A year or more passed when there came news of a dervish living in Soleimania. Abdul Baha was quite certain that his father would return. The next day my father walked into the house. We hardly knew him. His beard and hair were long and matted. He really was a dervish in appearance. The meeting between my brother and his father was the most touching and pathetic sight I have ever seen. Abbas Effendi threw himself on the floor before him and kissed and embraced his feet, weeping and crying, Why did you leave us? Why did you leave us? While the great uncouth dervish wept over his boy. The scene carried a weight not to be expressed in words. After the return of my father, the fame which he had acquired in the mountains reached Baghdad, and not only Barbies but many others came to hear his teachings, and many also came merely out of curiosity to see him. As he wished for retirement, these curiosity seekers were a great trouble and annoyance to him. This roused my brother, and he declared that he would protect his father from such intrusions. Accordingly, he prepared two placards, one for the door of his own room, which read, Those who come for information may apply within. Those who come only because of curiosity had better stay away. The other for the door of his father's room, of which the purport was, Let those who are searching for God come and come and come. Then he announced that he himself would first see those who came. If he found that they were genuine truth-seekers, he admitted them to his father's presence. Otherwise, he did not permit them to see him. Abdul Baha's days of formal schooling ended abruptly with the arrest and exile of Baha'u'llah and he did not attend any school in Baghdad. 
In the early years in Baghdad, he received lessons, sometimes from his mother, at other times from Mirza Musa, and occasionally from Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah also arranged for a certain imam of good character and sound education to discuss academic questions with Abdul Baha on certain mornings and afternoons. This man, whose name was Abu Salam Effendi, told Baha'u'llah, I have taught and studied for over 30 years, and yet, when students question me, I am obliged to refer to many books. Your accomplished child, on the other hand, is able to give explanations which have never occurred to me. Nabil has recorded the following explanation which Baha'u'llah gave to this learned man. The essence of the most great branch is indicative of the essence of God. The most great branch effortlessly comprehends scientific matters and perceives realities which others are incapable of fathoming. Even as the Bab who, with only a few pages of practice, was able to produce such exquisite handwriting. And although he spent no more than a few days in school, prolific was the divine knowledge which flowed from his heart. In the same way, as soon as some aspect of knowledge comes to the attention of the most great branch, he comprehends it to a degree that no scholar, however competent, can ever match. During these years, Abdul Baha went regularly to the mosque and discussed with doctors and scholars. They were amazed by his knowledge and insight and called him the wise young man. They asked him, who is your teacher? Where did you learn the things you say? He replied that it was his father who taught him. Even though he had never attended school, he was proficient in all the disciplines that educated children studied which greatly amazed those who knew him. While Abdul Baha was in his early teens, Baha'u'llah began to refer to his eldest son as the Master. And it was by this title that he began to be generally referred to amongst the believers in Baghdad. Mirza Mahmud i Kashani recounts the following incident which took place in Baghdad. I recall one day when Baha'u'llah was in a garden which he occasionally used to visit. Someone referred to a certain individual as Agha. On hearing this, Baha'u'llah was heard to say with a commanding voice, Who is Agha? There is only one Agha, and he is the most great branch. Even at this early stage in his life, he was beginning to take on the role that was to occupy him throughout Baha'u'llah's mission, acting as his deputy and shielding him from those who came to request an audience with Baha'u'llah merely out of curiosity. In those years, Baha'u'llah also gave Abdul Baha the title Mystery of God. In describing the role of Abdul Baha as the center of the covenant, Adib Tahazadeh writes, It would be a mistake to consider Abdul Baha as an ordinary human being who persevered in his efforts until he emptied himself of selfish desire and consequently was appointed by Baha'u'llah as his successor. Such a concept is contrary to the belief of those who have embraced the faith of Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha was created by God for the sole purpose of becoming the recipient of God's revelation in this age. We shall never know his real station because he was the mystery of God, a title conferred upon him by Baha'u'llah. He was the priceless gift of Baha'u'llah to mankind.